Okay. Blood sugar. I want to talk about blood sugar because as a ketogenic diet specialist that I know all about keto and I go to all the conferences and read all the research and I've been coaching it for years, who's also not dogmatic about keto. I'm not trying to convince anyone to do keto. I'm not saying keto is the one right way for all humans. Do I think it's important for your body to be able to go into a state of ketosis? Yes. Okay. But in, because I'm like in this weird world of like kind of in between the keto community and not, it's madness sometimes. Okay. Because I see this dogmatic thinking, this very cut and dry black and white thinking about carbohydrates and insulin and blood sugar. And I want to clear some things up. Okay. And this is honestly selfishly for me because I'm like, I'm so tired of these kind of like comments and thoughts. And I'm just like, oh my freaking God, people are so confused. Okay. So I'm going to try to clear it up. Okay. So if you are not insulin resistant, and I'll get into the, what that means and how you can know if you are in just a second. If you are not insulin resistant, your blood sugar going up is not a bad thing. You do not instantly store body fat from any rise in blood sugar or insulin. Okay. Do we understand this? Can, can, <laughs> can we accept this? Okay. So if, if blood sugar going up is a bad thing, then you better never exercise and you better never get nervous because your blood sugar is going to go up. So let's exercise is off the table too. Cause any rise in blood sugar is just going to make you fat. Okay, so let's talk about what happens. So I'm talking about somebody who's not insulin resistant right now. I'll get into insulin resistance in a second, okay? So I, for example, am insulin sensitive, meaning that my body, my cells respond well to I eat carbohydrates. This is normal metabolism, okay? This is like normal people <laughs> that haven't developed insulin resistance. You eat carbs. Let's say you eat carbs. Your, your insulin comes up. Pancreas releases insulin, goes into your, all those little sugars in your bloodstream and sends them to all your cells where they need to go. Your brain, your tissues, everywhere. Okay. Sends them to your cells, feed your cells. If there is anything left over, it has nowhere else to put them except fat stores. So that is part of the reason having muscles and being active is helpful because you're that those, they are like sponges for blood sugar, essentially glycogen, stored carbohydrate is what goes in your muscles and liver. Okay. So basically in a nutshell, what I'm saying is you eat carbs, your body sends them to all your cells for energy and blood sugar comes back down. That is not a bad thing. <laughs> okay. We have this like conception, especially a lot of people who've been indoctrinated by the keto community that any rise in blood sugar any rise in insulin is straight fat storage. So avoid carbs like the plague because they will make you fat instantly. And that is not true. Now, if you are insulin resistant, meaning for a host of reasons, probably inflammation, maybe overeating, under exercising for a long period of time, your cells have become more resistant to insulin. And the way you can know this is if you have elevated fasting blood sugar, and I'll get in that in a second too, then yeah, you have high blood sugar all the time. So you add more carbs on top of that. Your cells already aren't using the blood sugar that it has. And now you have an abundance of blood sugar. It goes really high. You're going to feel like crap. You're going to have these spikes and drops and feel crazy. And like, yes, if you are insulin resistant, I highly recommend doing a phase of keto until you fix that and probably pairing some berberine with it, 500 milligrams in the morning and with meals to help that process along. Okay. But in general, like I just shared a recipe that has oats in it. Here's another, I'm sorry, I'm on like a rampage right now. Cause like, I'm so tired of the fear mongering <laughs> in like the health optimization community. It's like, oats are bad for you. Kale is bad for you. Everything's bad for you. Bad for you. Bad for you. This is a black and white dogmatic. It's actually fear marketing. So be aware if you are being marketed to through fear, because one of the most easy ways to market to people, which absolutely freaking lutely, if you think the health community isn't marketing to you, you're like, like being very naive. Okay. They are. And one of the easiest ways to market to people is create a fear that they didn't know that they should have and then provide a solution to that fear. Okay. So if you're following accounts where it's be afraid of this, be afraid of that, be afraid of that. And then buy my product that can help you with the solution to that. They are using fear marketing on you. And I'm so tired of it. I'm so tired of it because I'm actually working with people one-on-one -on -one and I have to work through all that stuff. Right? Like I was just listening, um, Dr. Huberman, uh, was live. I, th I think he might still be right now. And I was listening 
And I saw that Dave Asprey posted that tattoos are toxic and heavy metals, blah, blah, blah. And somebody writes on there, uh, it, it asks Aunt Huberman a question. Is, are heavy, is, ta- are tattoos bad? Are they toxic or whatever? And he's like, eh, he's, he's very balanced. He's amazing. Do you guys know Andrew Huberman? I hope you follow him, but he's just like, yeah, I mean, maybe like, I'm not too worried about it. Right. But there's so many people out there that they're just like, sharing these messages to, that create this manic fear of everything and it needs to freaking stop. Okay. You guys, I'm, I'm doing everything I can to give you good information without creating some hysteria of black and white, good, bad thinking. Oh, Tara, just tell me that's bad. You know, like when, anyway, okay. <laughs> I'm going on a tangent here, but let's talk about, let's talk about healthy blood sugar response and what you need to know. Okay. First of all, do you get the oil checked on your car? Do you check in it? Do you have to replace oil in your car? Okay. So how long do you have your car? I don't know. Maybe if you're one of those long haulers, like 15 years or something, <laughs> right? A lot of you only a few years. How long are you going to have your body? Hopefully like 80, 90, 100 years, right? So checking your oil in your car is kind of like testing your blood sugar, especially as you're getting into like 30s, 40s, 50s check your freaking blood sugar. Okay. It's like basic stuff. Okay. It's just like checking the oil in your car. If you don't know one of this basic metric on your body, you can end up wrecking yourself. Okay. So how can we test our blood sugar? One, you can go to Walmart, Target, wherever right now, and you can buy one of those little finger pricker things. If you don't want to do that, you're like, then no freaking way I'm going to prick my finger, which I actually think you should, because it's good to get over that. Um, you could go into a lab. <laughs> I mean, they're going to really prick you. You could get your fasting blood sugar tested at a lab. You can actually order labs yourself on, there's a link in my little quick links. It's a uh, ultalabtest.com is who I use. You just order it online, go get yourself tested. You could do that. Or you could wear a continuous glucose monitor if you want to get really geeky, which is actually really cool. And there's a link for that on my website as well, on my discounts page, NutriSense. Okay, so that what that one's doing is checking your blood sugar for you all the time. And it's really cool. It hooks up to an app and there's nutritionists on there and they're kind of helping you along. It's really cool. Okay. So however you want to find out, you need to know what your fasting blood sugar is first thing in the morning. Okay. That means I haven't worked out. I haven't had coffee. I haven't done anything. I like rolled out of bed and checked my blood sugar. Okay. And if your fasting blood sugar is over 95, you are on your little path to insulin resistance. You want to see like ideally below 90 for fasting blood sugar. Okay. So that's how you can know. That's how you can know. So let's say you get your fasting blood sugar tested and you're like 87. Okay. We consider like 85, like perfect ideal. Right. So you're 87. So that means, yeah, you're probably insulin sensitive. You don't have insulin resistance. So what happens when you eat carbs? This is what drives me crazy is like, we have this fear, this like, it's from a lack of education and I get it. You guys are not, if you're not in the health world, like you're not like sitting there studying biochemistry and stuff. So I'm trying to break this down as simple as I can. If you are not insulin resistant, you eat carbs and your body uses them as long as you're not eating way too many, right? So for example, I wake up, I go train fasted. What am I doing? I'm dumping stored carbohydrates out of my liver and my muscles into my bloodstream to fuel that workout. So what does that mean? That means I have like space for more carbs, right? I have space. I've emptied out space in my body. So when I eat carbs, which I do every day, what are they going to do? They're going to refill my liver glycogen and my muscles with those carbs. Now, if I ate 600 grams of carbs every day, that would probably be more than I have room for in my muscles and my liver. So what would my body have to do? Store them as body fat. But, and so let's say you're really sedentary. Let's say you don't have a lot of muscle and you're not moving very much. So yeah, you're going to be limited on how many carbohydrates you can eat before it goes to fat storage because you just have probably have pretty fuel t- full tanks. Your muscles and your liver, your muscles are smaller, then you don't need as many carbs. End of story period. <laughs> you're never working out. You're not going to need as many carbs because it's going to take a while for your body to use the carbs that you've already stored in your liver and muscles. Okay. But let's say you're active. Let's say you're crushing it. Let's say you're getting in the gym every day and you've building some muscle. 
eating carbs is not a bad thing. It's going to go refill your muscles and your liver, and it's going to be readily available for you in your next workout. So it actually can enhance your results because now you have a performance ability, right? And carbohydrates do a million other things. It's not just about body fat. So I, I just posted some like oatmeal little balls. And I mean, I'm just being real. Somebody's like, oh, these are bad oats are the same thing as sugar. And I understand where this lady's coming from because she's heard this, right? I've seen doctors in the keto space that literally said that eating chocolate cake and quinoa is the same thing. It's very frustrating. I'm like, dude, seriously? You're telling people that eating quinoa and chocolate cake is exactly the same thing. Toxic is what I, it's toxic. <laughs> okay, so you take an insulin sensitive person who has a normal blood sugar response and you're going to tell them that chocolate cake and quinoa are the same thing? One is a complete, first of all, quinoa is a complete protein. It doesn't have any inflammatory oils, inflammatory, like white bleached out flour, um, sh refined sugar. And we're going to tell people also that oats and refined table sugar is the same thing. Are we freaking serious right now? I'm, I'm so tired of this madness. The oats are going to have, uh, vitamins, minerals, fiber, a million other things that are good for your body. Same thing as white table sugar, which is completely nutrient devoid except for just calories. It is not the same thing. And it is not processed the same in the body. And guess what? From person to person, and even from day to day, and even from hour to hour, you process different foods differently than the next person, or maybe how you did yesterday when you were sleep deprived. That's why the continuous glucose monitors are a really cool thing, because you can see I've had clients with continuous glucose monitors that barely get a blood sugar rise from bananas. <gasps> Not bananas. Those horrible, horrible things. They're so bad for you. They're toxic, genetically modified monsters that are just straight starch and they're just going to make you fat. Barely had a blood sugar rise from them. And then that this one client, she had a huge spike in blood sugar from strawberries. So what do we, I don't know. We, she Maybe she has a little bit of a food sensitivity to blood to strawberries. I don't know. But I've had multiple clients now that barely had much of a blood sugar rise from bananas. The thing that everybody likes to go around in their black and white thinking and just say, good, bad, good, bad, good, bad. This good, bad mentality, this black, white mentality around food and nutrition needs to die. It's low level thinking. I'm just gonna be honest. It's It's like, I just want to not think. <laughs> so just tell me what's good and what's bad. And I'm, what I'm trying to help you guys with is understanding deeper principles and also not get so manic. Uh, CGMs, uh, NutriSense is who I use. And there's a coupon thing on my website. Uh, if you go to my website link in my bio, um, they're really cool. Really, really cool. I was really impressed because they, they're really active on the app. Like, Hey, we noticed your blood sugar went up from that. Like want to help you with that. You know, it's pretty cool. Um, and there's also, I have a podcast with the head dietitian from NutriSense too. So, uh, Kara Collier, K-A-R-A Collier on my Inside Out Health podcast, if you want to kind of dive into that more. So, um, yeah, saying that an apple and chocolate cake is the same thing is the most ludicrous, ridiculous thing I have ever heard. The only instance in which I can kind of see what someone means is that if you are insulin resistant, if you are pre-diabetic or diabetic and you need to find out if you are, because guess what? Did you know they estimate that 88 million Americans are pre-diabetic and that 80% of them don't know it? That's where the estimates are. And I get clients all the time. I'm like, do I want to use the word pre-diabetic? <laughs> I don't want to freak them out, but I'm like, okay, we need to do a phase of keto <laughs> and some berberine and let's bring that blood sugar back down. But if you're not, let's say you test your blood sugar, you're like 87, 85 in the morning. There is, it is absolutely ludicrous to tell a person like that, that chocolate cake and an apple is the same thing. No, it is not. <laughs> and like, if you can get a blood sugar rise, so basically normal, you're going to, your blood sugar is going to rise after you eat something with carbohydrates. And then about two hours, you want that to be back down around like 115 to 95 on the two hour mark. So if you want to test that and get all geeky, I highly recommend it. <laughs> you're going to have this body till the day that you die. You know what I mean? Like check in on it a little bit, but I just had to talk about this because, ooh. Like as much as I appreciate some of my colleagues, like I, I appreciate like Jason Fung in so many ways, I will admit one thing I don't appreciate is this 
phrase of insulin as a fat storage hormone because it just freaks everybody out. Like, all they think is, like, oh, my insulin goes up, I get fat. And it's like, not when you're not insulin resistant. <laughs> Do you, have you ever seen a bodybuilder that like is like chucking rice in their mouth right after their workout, rice and chicken? Do you know why they're doing that as they're like walking out of the gym? Has anybody else ever seen that? They're like, ah. they're trying to raise their insulin to make the protein from that chicken to shuttle those amino acids into their muscles. They just crushed it in the gym. They just lifted a bunch. They got room for carbs, I promise. And they're intelligently using those carbohydrates to create an insulin response to shuttle those carbohydrates into their muscles, begin muscular repair, and the amino acids from the chicken. They want it all going in. So that's actually smart. And I promise those guys, most of them, unless they're on like steroids and super inflamed and all that, like <laughs> then they might become insulin resistant if they're eating too much and all that stuff. But in a, in a healthy way, that approach is actually really intelligent. Okay. So that's what I do when it does to me, the smartest time to eat carbohydrates and protein is after a workout, but we don't hear that. in like the keto low carb community, it's just bad, 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 bad carbs, bad, 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 make you fat. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. It's not true. It's true in certain cases. It's like, it's kind of like the, if it ain't broke, don't fix it thing. We need that lesson in like the health optimization community. I'm hearing stuff that's like an autoimmune diet preached to the general public, right? Like anti-nutrients and vegetables, for example. Most people don't need to worry about that. <laughs> you cook your vegetables and it, it triggers glutathione. That teeny tiny bit of inflammation triggers glutathione, which is an antioxidant in your own body. And it actually makes you stronger. But what do we hear? We hear, tell everybody to, to just never eat vegetables because those have anti-nutrients in them. And I'm like so freaking tired of it. It makes me want to like, just like grrr, beat my head against a wall. I'm so tired of dogma and nutrition. I just have to let it out. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, Mariah, I will, I'm going to try to refrain from my thoughts about Paul Saladino. Yeah. Um, Basically, he tore me to shreds on an Instagram live when I talked about eating carbohydrates one time and it was really disrespectful. So <laughs> the fact that he's now eating some carbohydrates, I'm just glad to see him doing that. <laughs> uh, it was a few years ago. Um, Got to make work, food work for you, not against you. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, he's learned his lesson, always learning. Yes. I'm glad to see that he is learning that carbs are not always the enemy, but I'm also frustrated because... I had to undo a lot of really unhealthy mindsets around carbohydrates in clients for many years because of those kind of dogmatic teachings. So yeah, I'm a little frustrated. I don't like dogma. Like be careful with dogma. Be careful who you're getting your information from. If they're just, everything is just this black and white, good, bad, yes, no. <clears throat> they are doing you a disservice. Okay. And it's honestly up to you to be curious and, 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 and skeptical don't believe everything you hear. You know what I mean? There are, it's not like one right piece of information and in nutrition and training and all of it. There's many different professional opinions. So take everything with a grain of salt. Um, would a fasting insulin test reveal if you are insulin resistant? Yeah. So HbA1c, um, it, it, it is a good test. And ideally you want to see if you're like ideal getting under 5.0 would be like super awesome. But yeah, if your HbA1c is like 5.7 or something like that, then yeah, you're most likely, uh, insulin resistant. And that test is just showing you what your blood sugar has been like, um, over a longer period of time than just that day, which is your fasting glucose test. <sighs> Uh, can I eat plant protein with animal protein? I want you to answer that yourself. <laughs> I want you to ask yourself if you can eat plant proteins with animal proteins. What do you think? I'm going to let you answer that. And the reason I'm not trying to be an asshole by asking it like that. I really, my, my intention there really is to like turn you back into your own power and like what feels right to you instead of this, like, because of social media, we have this, like, I feel like it puts people in this powerless, like, I don't know anything and I have to just do it the way all the experts say to do it. And, and it's like, creates this like disempowered manic state. 
And so I just like really want to push you to like take in information, food for thought, considerations. Okay, cool. Uh, she thinks that way. He thinks that way. Interesting. And, and try different things and see what feels right to you. But in a nutshell, like I'm, I'm very, very tired of, I feel like, cause I, I kind of went down the bodybuilding road and I've been in like the super health optimization, keto, paleo, like there's a lot of, um, unnecessary shit people are worried about. <laughs> yeah. Like, how are you looking at food? Food is full of nutrients. Be a nutrient hunter, right? It's helpful to know about macros. It's helpful to know that you need protein, fat, and carbs. It's helpful to know about micronutrients. It's helpful to know that some foods can be inflammatory for certain people. It's helpful to know all these things. But at the end of the day, if you eat oatmeal or Greek yogurt and you feel great after you eat it, but somebody's sitting there telling you that's bad, it's going to kill you, question the shit out of that question the shit out of that. Okay. Cause not everyone's opinion is right for you. Okay. All right. Um, what's up, Christine? Good to see you girl. Freaking love you. Um, I will forever be grateful for you to, that a banana wasn't going to kill me. Yeah, man. I feel like the reason you guys see me so heated on this stuff is because I'm frustrated because I feel like I have to undo so many of these mentalities in clients. They're like fearful. Let's think about that. Think about if everything you're eating, you're washing it down with a, with a big old drink of fear that it's going to hurt you. Go read the biology of belief by Dr. Bruce Lipton. Literally proving scientifically that you can change how things are biologically processed in your body through your own beliefs. Yeah, that's real. That's scientifically proven. That's the placebo effect, right? We all know that's real. So think about that. If you're sitting there and you're eating stuff and you're like, oh, shoot, I shouldn't be eating oats because that's going to hurt me. Now, a different stance is I'm going to try eating oats and some protein, some yummy things. And oh, shit, man, my body, ooh, my stomach actually did not like that. I'm, I, I thought, OK, this is going to be great. I was in a healthy, neutral place and like it's hurting my stomach. That's feedback from your body. That's super helpful. Listen to that. Say, okay, body. Sorry. Just trying that out. Thank you for letting me know. I'll lay off of that for a little bit. Let's try some other things. Okay. Um, what do you think about being ravenously hungry on keto? I love this question. Yes, I got some thoughts for you, girl. Even high blood sugar, but people just keep saying, eat more fat. You're not adapted and still addicted to carbs, but end up eating thousands of calories. Okay. I love this question. I talked about this a little bit in my book and short-term keto. Um, are you saying that you still have high blood sugar? I clarify that one for me. Okay. Um, so a couple of reasons people feel ravenously hungry and keto. The biggest one is not eating enough protein. And there's all this information out there saying that you'll get, you know, gluconeogenesis if you eat too much protein. And you, you, that, that means protein is turned into carbohydrate and kicks you out of ketosis. I say, don't freaking worry about that. We've actually really, really debunked the gluconeogenesis. It's not actually a thing for most people. And what I see is not eating enough protein because you're only eat, basically almost only eating protein and fat. And when you isolate macronutrients, this is what I wrote about in the book. In research, we've shown that when you isolate the macronutrients, the least satiating macronutrient when it's isolated by itself is fat. So you hear the opposite in the keto world, right? You hear like, oh, fat is so satiating. But when it's by itself, it is not. It is the least satiating. And, and protein is the most, it has the longest duration of satiation, right? Because it takes a long time to break down and use up. And carbs actually have the most immediate impact on satiety because that insulin response sends signals to your brain saying, okay, we have food now, right? So I wrote about this in the intro to my book. I never felt I, I could go a long time without eating on keto, which was really cool. And I love that adaptation that I created in my body, but I never felt full at the end of meals. And I was super insulin sensitive when I started keto. I was like a muscle machine training for the Boston marathon, weightlifting like crazy, 11% body fat. So I started keto in a kind of a unique place. I don't think most people start keto from that place. Um, and man, being that insulin sensitive and being deep in ketosis all the time, I was just like, freak, man, I'm so I just I'm not full at the end of my meals. It was like maddening. And I find myself like digging in the nut butters and eating like keto treats. And I'm like, what is happening to me? Like I, I thought I was in a good place with food. And truly it wasn't until after a year of keto bringing cars back in, I was like, holy shit, I'm back. 
I, if I can just have some sort of insulin response at the end of my meals, like some blueberries or strawberries or something like that, some sweet potatoes, like, and I knew that intuitively all along. I was like, freak dude, I just need like, can I just have some apple? <laughs> can I just have an apple? <laughs> you know, like I know I'll be good if I just have an apple, right? So I'm very candid about that. And that's why I wrote my book, Short Term Keto, because there's some really cool benefits of keto. I don't think most people need to be keto forever. Unless you're doing it therapeutically for like epilepsy or Parkinson's or, you know, if you're type 2 diabetic or, you know, if you're super insulin resistant, very obese starting, you're going to need to do keto for longer. Okay. But somebody like me who was already really insulin sensitive, to be honest with you, I did keto for a year. I probably would have been good in like four to eight weeks. I would have gotten plenty of the benefit I needed and could have been done. All right. But hey, you guys can learn from me. <laughs> um, Let's see. It would have been better if you had a little... Yes, some helpful carbs. Absolutely. Yep, yep, yep. We're on the same wavelength, girl. Can you make a reel with these hot topics? Uh, man, you're going to ask me to be short and concise? I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> I will post this live, but uh, yeah. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Challenge accepted. Um, I'm sure you have this, but the fire is going to be pumped. I'm tired of my clients complaining and overly stressed about food. Yup. Yup overly stressed about food. Now think about this. One of the biggest problems that we have in health today is people being trapped in fight or flight way too much, way too much. Guess what happens when you're in fight or flight all the time? Everything goes down. Your gut, your gut health, it starts locking up. Your body sends, um, it, first you're going to release a ton of adrenaline and cortisol, which can be energy mobilizing at first. But after time, and when that's happening all the time, now you start to get fat. Now you start to get insulin resistant. Your gut health goes down. Welcome to hypothyroidism, all of that. And what are we doing with all of this manic fear mongering around food? Putting him in fight or flight mode. That is why I do high mindset coaching with my clients. Cause I'm like, I'm like, you almost don't even need the training and nutrition part. Yes, I will give that to you. But like, it's the way you're looking at this stuff. It's the, the fear that like food is the enemy and like, I have to be skinny and all the outside extrinsic thinking. It's like, whoa, we need to bring it back inside of ourselves. Understand that food keeps us alive. It's for us. It's helping us. And so when we think of it that way and we have gratitude and we think, Hey, I've got this really complex body that has all these needs. What can I give it as the queen of this kingdom or the king of this kingdom? What can I give my little subjects to thrive? And you start thinking about that way and it gets real, real easy. It gets real, real easy. Instead of like, Oh man, I better not have one extra egg white. I'm going to get fat if I eat one extra egg white. Uh Oh, I went three grams over on fat today. Shit. I failed. Like we're doing people a huge freaking disservice with this. So yeah. Yeah. And keto, um, the comment that keto is not sustainable. It's, it's not even just that for me. It's like, I don't think it's optimal either. <laughs> I don't think it's optimal. Like if you can't have your body go in and out of ketosis, are you really metabolically healthy? If you have to only be in one tiny system of your entire metabolism, like you have to be only in ketosis, that's not a healthy metabolism in my opinion. So if you can't thrive in a ketogenic state, that's not a healthy metabolism. If you can't thrive eating carbohydrates, that's not a healthy state either. Being able to do both and be, that's called being metabolically flexible, right? And that's why I have the book and keto in and out and all these things. I'm just trying to help people be able to use the full capacity of their metabolism. But do I think it's optimal to like only ever? No, right? Plus like, dude, you got to be real advanced to maintain keto lifestyle without getting a restrictive mindset around food. Good luck. <laughs> Right? Like, I feel like with keto, when I put my clients on keto, I'm so careful with them. I'm like, dude, please remember that carbohydrates are not bad. They're not bad for you. It's just right now, your body will thrive if you get rid of them for a little bit so you can become more insulin sensitive. When you're more insulin sensitive and we're crushing it in the gym, they're going to be really good for you. Okay? So just remember, just remember that they're not bad. And that's what I see so much on social media, even from the highly influential, my highly influential colleagues, doctors in the keto space. It's this good, bad thinking way to, sorry, I swear a lot in real life. So I'll try to be mindful, but 
Way to F somebody up in their mind. Way to F somebody up in their mind to teach them that certain foods are bad. Because guess what? They're going to eat them. They're going to eat them eventually. And what happens? I just ate that thing that's bad. I'm a failure. I'm bad. Oh my gosh. What's wrong with me? Blah, 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 blah. Nice. Awesome. That's what people need. No. So it's not, no food is good or bad. Uh, my friend Sean Wells, I love Sean. If you guys don't follow Sean Wells, highly recommend. But Sean and I are very aligned. He's keto specialist. He's like way, way, way advanced. And he's been doing it forever. And I love, he, he has this rational approach. And this is one thing he says. He's like, is McDonald's bad for you? <laughs> and what are you going to say? Yeah. He's like, okay, well, if you were dying in the Sahara Desert and hadn't had any food or water for three days, would would a McDonald's value me value meal be good for you or bad for you? <laughs> and I love that kind of challenge, right? It's like, yeah, actually, the, it would promote longevity in that case, right? So, like, just I'm not promoting McDonald's. I actually do not support McDonald's and <laughs> will not, will not buy from there. But I'm just saying like getting out of this dogmatic, like good, bad, black, white is so important for us. It's like be logical about it. Be logical about it. All right. When's my app going to be released? Thanks for asking April 22nd. So coming right up and I'm going to be at my higher retreat, my first retreat I'm running when it comes out. So holy shit, it's going to be a little nuts. Good thing I've got an awesome assistant who helps me out. She's so rad. All right, mindset, mindset. Let's see, comments, metabol metabolic flexibility is the goal. Yes. What's your experience on doing keto and bodybuilding and weight training? I personally have the untypical experience, which is I have better workouts, feel stronger and leaner. Okay, so in your case, generally what I find is that people who have performance increases in the gym when they go keto usually had some inflammation going on, and that inflammation has been dropped, and now they're able to better perform. That is what I have found in my experience. Um, and, you know, typically it depends on how you're training. So if you're doing a lot of strength, heavy, lower rep, longer rest intervals, that's super complimentary with keto. But if you're doing a ton of like super high glycolytic activities that are really intense, high rep lifting, um, sprints, that kind of stuff, generally speaking, you're going to do better with carbs with that, right? That runs off glycolysis. So walking and then heavy, uh, lifts with longer rest intervals, strength work, really great for keto. Uh, more in, uh, high intensity exercise, all a little bit better with carbs. So, you know, I, usually when people train in the gym and they go keto, there's going to be like a little bit of performance drop. And the only people I've ever seen who had a performance increase, like straight out of the gate, they had a lot of inflammation going on, usually elevated C-reactive protein, something like that. So just my thoughts. Can't wait to read my book. Thank you. I tried to make it as enjoyable and fun as I could for you guys. Um... All right. Uh, the book is short term keto. It's on Amazon. If anybody wants to read it. So it's basically my experience and like how, the courage that it freaking took to start speaking out on this as like a keto specialist of like, it was scary guys. Cause I started speaking out on this in the middle of like the keto heyday. Right. It was like so bad for business. Right? I was like, no dude, no. And I felt so alone. I'm like, shit, am I the only keto specialist that think something's wrong here. And now a bunch of them are doing the same thing. So I'm proud of myself for listening to myself. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, how long do you recommend someone with Hashimoto's and hypothyroid do a round of keto? Um, I just feel better when I eat carbs. This is a really great question. Okay. So, um, Hashimoto's, which is like the autoimmune version of hypothyroidism or regular hypothyroidism, Generally speaking, like in my, you know, all my nutrition training, you want carbs for someone who has hypothyroidism, right? But what I have found in my experience, because hypothyroidism is almost always accompanied by poor gut health, I have found that decreasing inflammation and increasing gut health through a phase of keto, and in terms of duration, it really depends on the person, but I would say probably not more than like four to eight weeks max that healing that they've gotten from dropping down the inflammation in their gut and all throughout their body because ketone bodies are anti-inflammatory and then slowly reintroducing carbohydrates back in has been really successful for me with people with hypothyroidism. So just sharing that. But just in general, I definitely don't recommend somebody who has hypothyroidism being keto like forever because it actually, generally speaking, lowers 
free T3 lowers thyroid production, right? So, and then another quick note, if you have hypothyroidism, I really recommend doing my, um, my friend Barton's upgraded formulas, hair mineral analysis, because you can find out if you're de deficient in iodine, selenium, magnesium, some of these big hitters on thyroid production. So there's a link for that on my, on my website under discounts. It's inside out 15 is the, uh, coupon code with them. All right. Um, Joshua Brown wellness. What's up? Robert Lustig talks about this in his new book. No food is good or bad. Yes. What we do with it is what makes it helpful or not. Yeah. You know what guys, when I was filming my workouts for the app last weekend, you know what I intentionally ate was a don't two donuts, two donuts, two glazed donuts, because I wanted to fill my muscles full of glycogen as quickly as freaking possible. So that's how I did it <laughs> because it just makes your muscles look fuller for filming. So not saying I, I have no issues with that. I don't have gluten issues. I don't tend to feel addicted to sugar. And I think I don't feel addicted to sugar for two reasons. One, because I'm insulin sensitive, right? So I have healthy metabolism. And two, because I don't have a restrictive mindset around it. So much of like, binging and like this emotional eating stuff is caused by restrictive mindset. I promise you some of it is biological. Okay. It can be hormones and stuff like that. I get that. But a lot of it is mindset. If I'm like sugar's bad, 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 bad. I tell, I'm telling you, I promise you, you're going to end up eating it and you're going to binge on it. Cause it's this now or never thing because sugar's on the table for me all the time. Always. I could go have a bunch of sugar right now if I want. I don't want it because it drops down my mental performance for working and all that kind of stuff, right? So it's like, and I just know it's just not optimal, you know? So I'd just rather have something else. But I think that's why I don't have any issues with emotional eating anymore because I used to when I was in a restrictive mindset and those things were bad. <laughs> I don't, and I, it's, it's just crazy. Like people talk about like sugar is more addictive than cocaine and all that stuff. And I'm like, mm. Not when your metabolism is healthy and you don't have a restrictive mindset around it. <laughs> There's a lady on uh, Impact Theory. I forgot her name, but she was talking about how like guilt and shame can actually um, activate the dopamine reward system. So like when you guilt and shame yourself for eating certain foods, that it can actually increase the dopamine response and cause it to be more addictive. Isn't that fascinating in terms of restrictive mindsets creating addictions to things like sugar? So just saying, I just dropped in and realized I mentioned someone else's book. Oh yeah, yeah, no, please. I, all the more, the merrier, the more we need lots of help, lots of resources, lots of seats at the table here. So I'm, I, yeah, please. Um, all right. I was going to ask the same thing about doing keto and the effect on the thyroid. Yeah. So in the research, they show that, you know, dropping carbs will reduce thyroid function, but I've been a little bit of a rebel there because this was just me experimenting with some clients who were willing to do so. And I was like, you have a lot of inflammation and your gut health is really bad and your blood sugar is high. Let's try it. Let's try a phase of keto and see what happens. And it's been super good. So, but I'm always mindful of like, they need those carbs back eventually. Right. Because we want to help the thyroid production and also carbs prevent the rise of adrenaline and cortisol over time. And when you're in that ketogenic state for a really long time, you can actually get into that hyper adrenalized high cortisol state. It's more easy to, if you don't have adequate salt intake, so that's what I've done with people. And it's been really, really great. Um, a lot of people say doing keto for, oh, oh, wait, 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 hold on. I think that was the same question. My pain goes away when I'm a lower carb diet. Is it reduced inflammation? Absolutely. That's why like for people with things like, um, uh, arthritis or any sort of nervous system issue, Parkinson's, epilepsy, migraines. Um, it, it's re very inflammation reducing, right? So if you have a lot of inflammation, keto all the way, dude, heal that stuff. Cause ketone bodies themselves. So like, this is why you hear carbs are inflammatory. Have you guys heard that? So what happens is you eat carbohydrates and there is a little reactive oxygen species given off. Now in normal people who don't have high inflammation, you just produce your own glutathione to, to fight that off and everything's all good in the hood. And it, that little bit of inflammation is actually good for you to re, to trigger the release of glutathione and things get balanced. But if that's out of control and you're super inflamed, removing the carbohydrates for a while, so you don't get those reactive oxygen species because that doesn't happen with fat, 
excuse me, it's like really helpful. And then on top of it, the ketone bodies themselves fight inflammation. They act like antioxidants in the body. So super, super powerful for inflammation. If you are inflamed, you have elevated C-reactive protein or other inflammation markers in the body. Highly recommend doing keto for a while. Does it mean you always have to do it for the rest of your life? Probably not. Maybe in certain cases with severe, more severe things like um, epilepsy, but I actually believe that there's the potential for the body to heal from most things if it's given the right circumstances, the right environment to do that. You love my book. Thank you so much. You're very lean, low carb. I had to up your, my carbs. That makes my hormones so happy. My period's on point. Yes. Yes, girl. That makes me so happy to hear. Um, does your keto book explain how to introduce carbs back into your diet? Yes, it does. That is like the whole thing. The whole meal plan is slowly reintroducing car- reintroducing carbohydrates after a phase of keto is is the book. Um, and it goes into like neurotransmitters and gut health and all of these different reasons that I think you don't need to do keto forever, right? So there's a bunch of logic and then there's the whole meal plan. There's actually a training plan too. Um, some keto influencers say it's totally normal for T3 to go down because T3 only went up to process the carbs. Opinion on that or is that BS denial? The truth is that we don't really know. We have like three or four research studies maybe max on like carbohydrates and thyroid production um, in terms of keto research. So I, I, I get where they're coming from. I get where they're saying like maybe, maybe the thyroid production goes up in order to help with carbs. But I'd say, I mean, just from my education background that was like not keto, right? From the certifications that I have, we, it's definitely recommended that if you want to boost your thyroid production, that you eat carbohydrates in order to do that. They're helpful for that. But like I said, I I won't explain that whole thing about the phase of keto, but I do think it can be helpful, but I don't know, man, I get a little concerned when I start hearing like, Oh, it's totally fine that your thyroid's like really low while you're on keto. Like I'm like, "Mm, maybe (laughs) it's a little bit of a stretch. So the truth is I just don't know. And I don't think anybody really does yet. So, all right. Wowie. I went off. (laughs) Can you guys tell that I am like a little heated about this subject of good, bad thinking around food, black, white thinking and dogma and all of that. I just, I can't dude bring the power back into yourself. Start getting curious, be curious and be skeptical always with me, with anyone Bring the power back into yourself. See how you feel when you eat a certain way. Be real with yourself. Okay, I just ate brownies. How do I feel? Actually, I feel fine right now. Or, no, dude. (laughs) I don't feel fine. I just ate Brussels sprouts. I'm so freaking bloated. My stomach hurts. Just listen to that. Next person, I just ate Brussels sprouts. I feel freaking awesome. I love how I feel when I eat Brussels sprouts. You got to take it back into yourself. Okay, so take every take information in. That's great. Run it through your filter of truth. Try things out. It's okay to disagree with the experts. I disagree with a bunch of them all the time, and I'm sure a bunch of them disagree with me. We all have different opinions, different experiences. We're looking at things from different angles. But I like my message to you guys is please freaking take the power back into yourself. See how you feel when you try different things. Okay, okay. Um, real quick on this last one, if you are pre-diabetic, um, and insulin resistant, you're, pre- you're going to need to do keto more than four to eight weeks. It's going to take longer than that. I would honestly recommend adding berberine 500 milligrams in the morning. And with your meals, you can run that by your doctor, but berberine super helpful. It's basically the plant version of metformin. So it just kind of speeds that insulin sensitivity process along. But yeah, if you, um, oh, and you have hypothyroid and Hashimoto's. Yeah, no, I would still do, I would do keto until your blood sugar starts to get normalized. And so you're going to test that little by little. Okay, last thing, last thing, last thing. When you've been keto for a while and you eat a bunch of carbs, your body is not used to producing enough insulin to compensate for that. So you're going to feel like, like when I was keto and I would eat like go crazy and eat like cupcakes or something and like go totally off, I would like literally fall asleep. Like I was like going in a diabetic coma (laughs) because my, my body was just not used to producing insulin at that level to handle that. That doesn't happen to me now. I could totally, you know, and we have research to support this as well. So, um, about, so what I'm trying to say is 
probably do keto for, I mean, I gosh, I, it's hard to tell you over a live, right? But I would say plan on it at least getting up for like three to six months, three months, maybe start at three months and then slowly start to bring uh, fibrous whole food carbohydrates in small amounts and see what your blood sugar response is, right? And I would take like a two week break, actually a three week break because it takes about two weeks for that to get normalized. Take a three week break and, and have small amounts of carbohydrates and test your blood sugar. I would if I were you, dude, I would get a NutriSense, a continuous glucose monitor during that three-week phase and see how your body's reacting. And if you have good, healthy blood sugar response again, bring the cars back in. Start reintroducing, right? So that's my thoughts on that in a nutshell without working with you directly or <laughs> trying to be fast. All right, guys. Thank you for joining me. No food is good or bad. Bring the power back into yourself. What's good for you might be bad for somebody else. And what's bad for you might be good for somebody else. Okay? Much love. Bring it all in here. Ask yourself. Ask yourself. Take information and ask yourself. Okay. Love you guys. Bye.